Hello, and welcome to the Video Archive Series. In this series, we interview members of the SMU community who can provide insight into the history of SMU, especially from the perspective of their time with the university. I'm Carter Murphy, and with me today is uh, SMU trustee Lamar Hunt. Lamar, it's uh, good to see you again. Thanks, Carter. Glad to be here. And uh, <clears throat> let's, let's begin it at the beginning of time, in a sense, uh, about your coming to SMU. I know you had been preceded as an undergraduate by your brother Bunker and by your sister Caroline, I think. Did your mother play a role in her children uh, attending this university? Well, only, I guess, in the context that uh, I think I would uh, probably get influence from her and would like to have uh, come to SMU. I went away to a boys' school in Pennsylvania called the Hill School, mm -hmm. and I was there for five years uh, between the ages of uh, 13 and 18 and approximately. So by being away five years at a boys' boarding school, I was ready to you, come home, uh, uh, and, and also I was a big fan of Doak Walker and SMU football. Uh, not necessarily in that order. Probably Doak Walker was the, uh, oh, I didn't know him at the time. He was probably the number one influence in my life because I, I loved football, played it in high school, and uh, wanted to play at SMU. What position did you play in high school? Uh, I was uh, primarily a quarterback and uh, occasionally a tailback in high school at the Hill that's, School that's in That's a lot Potsdam, of flexibility. <laughs> Well, I, and a linebacker on defense at that time, I, I play, people played uh, both ways. And uh, at SMU, I had the good fortune to participate on the football teams. First, the freshman football team, uh, and at that time, freshmen were not eligible to play on the varsity. And then I played uh, three years of uh, on the varsity. Uh, but really didn't play enough to uh, letter. I, I was a participant and uh, a squad member. Uh, and what position were you playing then? I played in uh, as a actually as a wing back in my freshman year, and then once I was uh, came up to the varsity, I played in, and that's uh, as an end of the bench in my case. <laughs> but you were obviously fast. No, no, not really. And could hold on to the ball. Yeah, I was fast getting to the uh, hamburger stand nearby, probably. <laughs> Let's come back to football later. In the meanwhile, what did you find at SMU? What kind of a place was this when you came? Well, it was obviously a smaller school then, and yes. uh, the years I was at SMU were 1951 through I actually graduated in the class of 56. So. I was here for five years, and the school was smaller at that time in number of students, and obviously not nearly as... Uh, the physical plant was vastly different, wasn't it? Very much so, sure. Uh, we're sitting uh, today for this interview in what used to be the Humphrey Lee uh, Student Union, and, and uh, at the time when I was here at SMU, there was a, uh, a, a temporary building that was the student union, the bookstore, and uh, it wasn't, it was located a few hundred yards from here, but it was strictly a temporary building left over from, uh, I suppose, from World War II. Uh, very likely. This building was <coughs> under construction then, I suppose. It was. I believe it opened in my senior year or there about towards the end of my years at SMU. Uh, <coughs> this building was certainly one of the impressive showpieces of SMU when I came to visit in uh, 1961. Uh, it was a beautiful student union at that time, it seemed to me. Yes. Little did I think that the department I joined would later be academically located in this building, uh -huh. as in fact they are. Well, the student union was here, and it, it, it appeared then before you graduated. You got to... Uh, I, I believe it probably was finished that same year that I graduated. You majored in uh, geology. Not surprising, I suppose, given that the family fortune was based on oil. Uh, the, uh, where was the geology department located? Well, I can't swear that the department was located there, but I remember very clearly having classes in the Fondren Science Building. Mm, it must have been quite new. Yeah, it was. It was, uh, again, it was open just a year or two before I graduated, so some of my courses were definitely taken in that building. I remember having uh, 
uh, classes also in Dallas Hall. I had one that uh, I was very fearful of. Uh, it was a speech class, <laughs> and it used to terrify <laughs> yes. me to death. I think I was when I was a freshman or a sophomore, and I took a speech, and wow, I was scared every time I had to speak in that class. What do you think of your SMU undergraduate education? What have you thought of it over the years as you've followed a very successful business career? Uh, was it a good education? It, Are I, you glad you came? I definitely am. I, uh, as I said earlier, I, I had gone away to school, to a boys' school for five years, so I was really glad to uh, be able to come home. And uh, I lived at home, actually, for most of the time period, although I occasionally stayed at the fraternity house at SME, where I was a Kappa Sigma. Mm -hmm. And uh, But I've, I treasure those days and times at SMU from the people that I met, uh, the uh, uh, students, boys and girls, that uh, I was able to share an experience with. And it's uh, enjoyable even today in later life to run into some of those people here or there. And uh, so I, I think the people associations are the number one thing I enjoy. Did you have any regret at not having lived in uh, university housing? No, I don't. Uh, I, I really don't have a recollection other than, as I said, the fraternity house I stayed in for short periods. But I, I don't uh, really recall the university housing, uh, how that fit into the student life at that time. I, I just I wasn't part of it because I was living at home. Yeah, I, I raised the question because I went to a TCU in Fort Worth my first two years. And I lived at I lived at home, but I felt very much out of the swim of, of the the social life of the university, and finally persuaded my father to let me go away in my my junior year to uh, to join the crowd on the campus. Did you get interested in sports at SMU? You you've been a lifelong devotee of that, and have done perhaps more than anyone else as a promoter of sports in this country and in the world. Well, I really uh, thank you for that comment, but I, my association and interest with sports goes back long before I came to SMU. I can remember as a young boy, I used to play imaginary football or baseball games in, uh, in, in our yard. At, uh, we lived out near White Rock Lake. And uh, so I, I was uh, interested in sports and, of course, did participate in the uh, high school sports of uh, baseball and football at the Hill School. And so it was a natural carry forward to uh, SMU. And I, I had hopes to be a, a strong participant mm -hmm. on the football team, but I was nothing more than a squad man. Was Doak Walker still here when you came? Was he still uh, on the team? No, Doak Walker was not. Uh, his last year on the team was 1949. Oh, yes. He graduated, I think, in 50. Yes. And uh, then I came in the fall of 1951. Mm -hmm. Who were the other members of the team that you remember? Who were the stars of that generation? Oh, gosh, there were, there were lots of good ones. and. Uh, there are two that I'm very proud to have gotten to play with were Raymond Berry and Forrest mm. Gregg, mm. who were both teammates, and both of them are uh, went on to great careers in yes. pro football and are uh, in the Pro Football Hall of Fame as members there. And uh, but there were there were lots of uh, great players. Dick Hightower was, I believe, the captain of the team uh, probably my first year at SMU, captain of the varsity team. Well, Forrest Gregg came back to SMU and rescued us at an important, an important time when athletics had fallen on bad times and Forrest came and uh, was, was enormously helpful in restoring things. He was indeed. The, mm. How about the other? How about other sports? You, uh, in your subsequent career, you've been much uh, associated with uh, soccer and with tennis. You formed the World Championship Tennis, as I remember. That's right, uh, World Championship told. Tennis. I, I didn't play the game until I was in my 30s, but and was all never more than a mediocre player. But uh, I enjoy the challenge of the show business aspect of. Uh, uh, 
sports and the professional entertainment business, and, and we did form a group called World Championship Tennis, which uh, promoted tennis events, and uh, uh, interestingly, one of the uh, more successful ones we promoted was here on the SMU campus. Uh, and I remember that. It played, came, in, played in Moody Coliseum, was it right. not? That's mm right. -hmm. It came to be known as the WCT Finals, and uh, Moody Coliseum was almost like a building that was designed for tennis. It was so, had such great sight lines. Uh, yeah. Well, tennis is a great spectator sport, I think, and uh, it has, it's become a big uh, part of the entertainment industry, in fact, uh, thanks to the kind of promotion that you and uh, you and the others. WCT uh, folded into some of the other, uh, uh, into the other associations, didn't it? Yeah, WCT eventually went out of business uh, in favor, if you would, of the uh, what's called the Players Association, the ATP Players Association. The players wanted to run their own tour, and WCT's part in the game was to help uh, open up the game to professionals. And I want to mention, I should mention one thing because it uh, is uh, archival information that shouldn't be forgotten that uh, one of the great <coughs> tennis matches of all time was played in the WCT finals. Uh, I'm, I'm going to say it was 1972 at Moody Coliseum and it was Ken Rosewall against Rod Laver and a five-set uh, finals of the WCT finals, and it's considered one of the great, uh, one of the five greatest professional tennis matches of all time. Well, I hope we have that on tape somewhere. <laughs> uh, it is, somewhere, <laughs> someplace, yep. I can't help but ask you about the, uh, the future of collegiate sports, because, uh, well, you yourself in promoting professional teams, uh, some people point out that that's part of the great, uh, it's the, the disease that has made collegiate sports more difficult to sustain. But still, uh, we are sustained. Uh, has it a great future again to ever be the great entertainment industry it was at one time? You're talking about uh, college athletics? Yes. Well, I think so. Football, and basketball. Sure, and, and uh, you know, I think that a key aspect of that uh, focuses on basketball and football, uh, which both are sports that have great individual following or great collective following, I guess you would say, on the university level, not, not in every market. Now, SMU has struggled in recent years in that respect, but uh, some of the big universities like Ohio State or Tennessee or Nebraska, I mean, I'm just picking uh, ones that are big yeah. state schools, they are enormously uh, well supported. And financially supportive of their universities? Or are they a, a I, I think cost? so. I think, uh, and I think that's one of the important things about uh, college athletics is that they serve as a, a rallying point for the alumni. No doubt about uh, it. To be supportive of their school, to be interested in their school, and so on continue to be identified with it over a long number of years. Uh, I think it's, uh, and quite apart from the public relations it creates, the sports pages are read by millions of people and uh, universities' names become known or unknown <laughs> in part because of the success of their teams. What about our new stadium? Uh, I recall our having first met when uh, I was a member of the so-called Blue Ribbon Committee and you were invited and were kind enough to attend one night and talk about uh, the, the, archi the, 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 the appropriate architecture for a new stadium for the campus. We were much concerned that it would be too big and it would overshadow everything. And you, you argued that it should be to a great extent underground, as I recall, or below ground. Below maybe. ground, yeah, below grade level. Yeah. What about the Ford Stadium? How does it meet your criteria? Well, I think the, first of all, the architects and the planners and the, uh, and the university did a great job on that facility. I had the uh, honor to serve later on the uh, building committee and to help raise some of the funds for the building of Ford Stadium. And uh, I think it's turned out extremely well. And I hear over and over from people 
uh, in the football business, I'm talking about in the NFL, that uh, how impressed they are with the uh, physical facilities of the Ford Stadium. It's a monumental structure. It's a beautiful structure at the entrance. And I think it's very tastefully done. I, and I, obviously, being a great admirer of Doak Walker, I love the Doak the Walker Plaza, the statue there in front. Yes. Oh, that's a great uh, a souvenir of, of, of great times past. You, uh, you have been uh, enormously helpful, I think, in uh, finding financial support for SMU athletics. You served, as I was told, on the campaign for 2000 or something to sell season tickets for the first season of games in the stadium. Yes, I did. And yeah. uh, on the athletic committee of the subsequent campaigns. Um, are we going to find, how successful are we going to be in finding financial support for athletics? <clears throat> well, you know, I think that the, the story is going to be told in the future with, uh, depending on how successful SMU is uh, in competing in the, in the conferences uh, uh, with their teams in the various conferences. And uh, unfortunately, in recent years, they haven't been very competitive in football and basketball. But uh, that's where the key lies. I think if they can become a representative team in a, a permanently uh, established representative conference, and I think the new conference alignment with uh, Conference USA is going to help in that respect. Of course, success breeds success. Uh, a winning team uh, helps recruiting and, and, and subsequent winning teams. So it's... Uh, one has to get off of dead center at some point in this growth process, don't we? That is correct. You, you hit right at it, and the alumni are, uh, you know, intimately uh, familiar with that. They, uh, everybody wants to support a winner. Uh, there's a, you know, a little more cachet, if that's the right word, to be supportive of a winning team yes. and there is a losing team. Yes, it's fun to talk about when we're winning and it's not so much fun uh, when, we're, when we're not. We mentioned earlier, uh, I remember the importance of your son Clark uh, as the captain of the soccer team during the period when football was suspended on the campus and soccer became our great men's sport. And uh, we, all, we all turned out to the soccer games whereas we we hadn't always gone to the soccer games before, but Clark was a hero of the university at that point. Well, he, hey. he had a, uh, uh, first of all, he had a wonderful uh, career at SMU as far as I'm concerned academically, uh, where he graduated as code number one in his uh, senior class. I remember using it as an illustration, mm, that ath athletes needn't, needn't be uh, poor students. Yeah, he was in the class of 1987, but he, uh, played four years of varsity soccer and was a four-year letterman. He played uh, first for Jimmy Benedict for one year and then Shellis Heinemann came when Clark was a sophomore and uh, of course Shellis still is there uh, all these years later now in 2005 he's still mm -hmm. coaching away here at SMU but Clark had a fun career and my wife Norma and I uh, got to and enjoyed very much getting to see Clark play and be part of those fine SMU teams. How about the other sports besides football and, uh, and say, soccer? We've got basketball and tennis and golf and baseball and the women's sports. Uh, is there a place for those? Can we uh, do them uh, in a way that's financially viable? Well, I'd like to think that there is, and, and I believe there is. Uh, some of them obviously are what are considered really non-revenue sports and the, mm -hmm. the key ones we got to develop the revenue are men's basketball and, and men's football. But I think there's a place for other sports and SMU's done a great job. Carl Neufeld, the tennis coach, has uh, achieved some great things with the tennis program and, and uh, Rhonda Rampolo with the uh, women's basketball program. And, Various other coaches in other sports. SMU has been very well-rounded, good, good swimming teams, and until recently, uh, outstanding track and field teams as well. You've now been a trustee for a number of years uh, at SMU, and uh, the trustees hold the university in its 
in its hands in the present and in the future. What, uh, what, what are our, our great assets in uh, going forward? What are the SMU's strengths on which we build? Well, I think one of SMU's main strengths is the location in the, uh, the community of Dallas. Of Dallas. Yeah, the city of Dallas is a huge asset uh, for uh, really everything in this community. Uh, the people and the geographic proximity and the airport, and you can go on and on. There are lots mm -hmm. of uh, uh, things that are great about this community, but uh, I think that's an important asset for SMU, and it uh, does, uh, the school does attract students from all over the country, which pleases me because uh, I think that, uh, that a well-rounded university uh, is going to be much more than just some young men and young women from the state of Texas. You need them from all over. We do, and for that we often need uh, financial support for students. Uh, the students who come from small towns often uh, look with great uh, fear at uh, SMU's costs, but fortunately a large proportion of our students have some financial aid and uh, which makes the education at a private institution possible. The, uh, I was a member of a committee at the time, uh, uh, at the time our current president came, uh, concerning the relationship between SMU and the community, and I was convinced, and I think all my colleagues were convinced, that uh, SMU needed to reach out. It was not only the community that had to feed SMU, but SMU needed to uh, participate deeply in, uh, in the community and uh, in a way that was giving as well as receiving. So that, uh, that there's a mutual role, it is, I think, between SMU and the city of Dallas. As we move forward, what have to be the priorities of a private university that's seeking to raise itself in the ranks of such institutions in the country? Well, we, I think we all want to see the school achieve higher and higher academic standing and uh, standards, and that is happening. Uh, we want to attract... Uh, how, was, how was it marked, Lamar? Well, I don't know how they uh, judge it, but uh, various uh, aspects of the school are judged by uh, business publications mm -hmm. for the business school and I suppose medical publications for uh, other aspects. So it, it's, uh, and some, some of it would be a very inexact science, but it's uh, no doubt. But it's the quality of the research and writing on the part of the faculty is important then. I, I, mm -hmm. I would think so. I would think so. And from uh, my association with the Board of Trustees, it's been fun for me to be able to meet and know some of the outstanding professors at SMU and uh, in recent times. And we have some distinguished colleagues, and I've always been very proud to be part of this community. But uh, do we put our priorities, we put a lot of money into and a lot of effort into building the, uh, building the new plant in the last five, six, seven years and transformed the campus. We now have a beautiful campus. We had a, we had a, we had a nice campus before, and now we have quite a, a monumental one. Do we put uh, our resources now into people as we go forward? Well, I think uh, certainly people, the, the people that I think of are the uh, professors and, uh, and also more, it's more than that, it's the administrators. And uh, I think SMU has a truly outstanding president in Gerald Turner, who's been a great leader for the university. He he's, has been. He's a good, He's a very exceptional fundraiser, and he's a problem solver, and Lord knows there's lots of problems. Universities have problems. Every right. organization does, but I think universities are peculiar in having more than most, maybe, well, it sometimes. It seems that way, yeah. The, as the university grows, you have been a great promoter of enterprises uh, with great success. Are those are the kinds of ideas one uses to promote a business uh, applicable to uh, the building of a university? Well, certainly to a degree they are. I mean, you're staffing and you're financing people who work in areas of finance and administration are uh, really top-notch at SMU. And I think 
uh, the ability to attract those people uh, to the uh, university is important to the overall growth of the university. And the, uh, uh, I mentioned Dr. Turner and his fundraising ability is quite important to keep the standard of the buildings on campus uh, in, in a first-class fashion. And, uh, and the availability of funds to hire the best minds we can find that's in right. this country and keep bringing, keep bringing them to this community. Very important because uh, outstanding minds on the professor level will certainly inspire the students who work with them. And as you say, build the reputation of the university among uh, their peers, uh, they, uh, their colleagues at other universities, and their colleagues in government, and their colleagues in business and, uh, and, and in science. It is, universities are quite unique. Uh, uh, they are unique uh, uh, from other business enterprises, despite the fact that they sell services and must find a market for those services. But we have these qualities of having a uh, most of its employees being lifetime appoint, uh, appointees and uh, demanding academic freedom and demanding participation in governance of the institution. One doesn't find those in a private enterprise. Uh, and still, the university enterprise has to be promoted and sold and marketed in a way that's much like other enterprises, it seems to me. It does indeed, and I'm impressed uh, with the job that SMU does nationwide uh, in telling the story and in attracting students and so on. Do you see yourself having any a, a unique role in the Board of Trustees? Well, I can't say that I have a unique role. Uh, I'm, I'm proud of the fact that I've been uh, associated with SMU for many years, first as a little boy. and. Uh, my first kind of recollections of SMU are a 1939 football game, or no, I'm sorry, maybe it was 40 or 41. I mean, it was the famous game against Texas A&M where the bleachers collapsed and uh, a bunch of people suffered broken legs. Uh, but, where, where, uh, was that, that, where was that game played? Well, it was at what used to be Owenby Stadium. Yes. It's, uh, it's the same site now yes. as uh, Ford Stadium, but. It was a, an earlier stadium located at that site. And, uh, but, uh, you know, I, I first became a fan of SMU and as a young boy and then uh, a bigger fan when Doak Walker and Kyle Rote were here and then uh, went to school here. And I probably was a long way from the best student anybody ever saw, but I was, uh, I'm a conscientious believer nevertheless in uh, a conscious believer <laughs> is a, maybe a better word in, in SMU as a university and as an institution in Dallas that is a very important part of this community. Well, SMU made an imprint on you and you've made a vast imprint on this university for which we're, which we're very grateful. Is there anything else we should record for the archives this afternoon? Um, our, the end of our tape is approaching. Well, but, I would uh, just, it would probably be good for me to put in perspective my football career because uh, as the st years go by, football careers are embellished. And uh, I remember clearly that uh, the SME football team played a 10-game schedule when I was here each year. And you had to play 60 minutes per year to letter. And as I said earlier, I never lettered. I, I did get up where my last year here I played a total of 15 minutes in the 10 games. Were you playing end at that point? Yeah, I was, a, I was the end and I, it mostly end of the bench is the <laughs> way I refer to it. But uh, those were formative years as far as I was concerned and I think from a business career standpoint I've most been identified with the sport of football. And I would really like to think that uh, it's a truism that, uh, that my involvement in the football program here, I, I had a love for the game, a love for participating in it, and the friendships that I developed and the hard knocks that I took, because uh, I wasn't a very good player, 
they were all an important part of what later became my primary business interest, the Kansas City Chiefs. Yes. We've been talking this afternoon with Lamar Hunt, a trustee of SMU and a, an alumnus and uh, a, a distinguished citizen of this country. Lamar, it's uh, been fun to talk, and uh, I hope these uh, memories uh, are of some use to uh, those, those who will see this piece of the archives uh, down the way in the future. Well, it's been my pleasure to be here with you, Carter, and thank you so much. And uh, uh, part, I apologize for my raspy voice today, but uh, Hopefully it won't come through too badly. It's the season for hay fever. Yep, something like that. <laughs> Good. Thanks again. Thank you.